Today, I wanted to take a second to talk about the new parallel ash can to Pete, although I suppose he's not quite new anymore. I think the first and most important thing about him that you can notice here, he starts with more soak, and this is because he doesn't start with Duke and play. He has the same stat lines as the original Ashcan Pete, which means his terrible do something stats are a really big problem because you don't have the one action per turn covered by Duke anymore, and not unless you draw him, you can still run him, but he won't be starting in play with the alternative back. So the new version of Parallel Ashcan Pete needs to find a way to be valuable despite their bad stats. We begin the game with Pete's guitar, and as you can imagine, it's going to be really important what Pete's guitar does, so let's scroll down to that immediately. Pete's guitar is a slotless asset that starts in play, much like Duke, and it has a lightning bolt ability, exhaust Pete's guitar, choose a non-elite enemy at your location or connecting location, move that enemy once in a direction of your choice, then if there are no enemies at your location, either heal one horror or gain one resource. This is really bloody strong. Now, I'm playing it in Forgotten Age, and I get the distinct impression that Forgotten Age might be one of the best locations for this ability. But fundamentally, the ability to just gain a resource or heal a horror every turn means you're effectively immune to horror damage, and you're going to be very, very wealthy, especially for Survivor. And then additionally, you're not just doing this as an economy thing, that's a side effect. The main reason to do this is to take an enemy that's currently engaged with someone and throw it off of them. If you can find a way to prevent that enemy from hunting into you and being a problem in the future, which for a lot of enemies that don't have Doom and aren't Hunter, the enemy was just solved completely. But if it does have Hunter, if you can find other cards that synergize with the new Parallel Pete, then you can find a way to solve it and it's really valuable. However, it's important to mention, we're a character with bad do-something stats and the thing we're getting to compensate for it specifies non-elite. This always sketches me out a lot. Now, coming back to Parallel Pete, where he has a reaction when a card you own that is attached to a scenario card would be discarded, add it to your hand instead, limit once per round. And what this means is there are a bunch of cards that are essentially trap cards. You attach them to a location, they go off, and then they get discarded. This allows you to replay trap cards. So the idea becomes pretty obvious now. You use the guitar to bounce the enemy away, and then you set up some sort of trap either in the room they're going to or the room they're coming to to deal with them, and then you get the trap back. That's the general gist of the idea. And his star allows you to get a chosen trap card back to your hand that's currently attached to something. This isn't a great star because you can't predict it, but it does give you some ability to get a trap back if you place one down that turns out to not go off and you would really like it in your hand as opposed to uselessly sitting on the board. I would say that his star is honestly pretty garbage. But amongst the garbage stars that do almost nothing, this is one of the better low-tier star effects. On Ashkin's card back, you have a deck size of 30. You go down to Survivor 0-3, to three, which is not a big deal. Basically, the only high-experience card that Ashkin might have cared about at all was probably like a highly upgraded multi-tool. And in exchange for losing 4 and 5, you get improvised and tactics cards level 0-4 to four from any color, which I think might be nearly all of them. I don't know if there are any level 5 improvised or tactics, but regardless. You also get five zero guardian cards, and that's not actually good at all. You had five zero anything cards in the original Ashcan, so this is still downgraded from original Ashcan. So really, what you're getting is that trap access that I was talking about to actually make the archetype work. Coming over to my deck for parallel Ashcan Pete that I'm currently playing a return to Forgotten Age and a low vengeance run, I'm really only running hiding spot. I'm not doing much in the way of traps. I'm also running Dynamite Blast, and I think you can see how that's basically a pseudo-trap in this deck. But I'm not running much in the way of the stuff that Parallel Pete does, and the reason is because I kept looking at all the cards, and I'll go ahead and bring this up now, but I kept feeling like all of them were inferior to Hiding Spot. Pete's access to level 0 to 4 Improvised cards really just allows him to get two more levels on Makeshift Trap. The rest of this is just level 0 red stuff, so the main thing is it allows you to look at Makeshift Trap, and try to establish what do you want to add to your trap. And I really felt like I was just making janky dynamite. I didn't feel like I was getting a lot done here. I, I realized there's value in getting the nets. And that comes into what you get access to with tactics, because barricade is essentially the net. You can get barricade, and you can even get the level three barricade, which is actually pretty solid and something I'm considering upgrading towards later. But essentially, most of these trap cards do one of two things. They prevent enemy movement, which Ashcan Pete's already managing to some degree, just baseline with the guitar. Or you'll find a lot of cards like Ambush that deal damage. But they deal damage for a lot of money. If you're trying to recur something that costs two resources, that's a pretty big economy drain and I'm kind of afraid of it, to be honest. 
So I kept feeling like my job wasn't really to kill enemies. My job is to make enemies not a problem, make them not attack you. And Hiding Spot is far and away the most effective card in that regard. You have access to a bunch of cards that are like pseudo fighting cards that are not super effective. And then you have Dynamite Blast, obviously, which I do think is worth using because you have access to Pete's guitar to move them together for it. But the vast majority of this stuff isn't really traps, and what traps you do end up getting access to feel fairly redundant with Hiding Spot. That's the big thing. Hiding Spot's a one-cost fast event. Attach it anywhere on the map. You don't have to be there, which is weird, but very helpful. Each non-elite enemy at the attached location gains a loop. Now, it's important to understand, gaining a loop does not make them stop fighting. You can't just slap Hiding Spot on a location and now you're disengaged. That's not what it says. You can engage a loop enemies. What this says is if you play this before the Mythos phase, then an enemy spawns here, it'll spawn a loop and it won't do anything. More importantly, if you put this on a location and then use a guitar to bounce someone into it, they'll become aloof at that location and not engage people who are there. Additionally, if you need to be where you currently are, you can just bounce them off of you, put it where you're at, and while they will hunt back to you during the enemy phase, they won't hit you, this will discard at the end of the enemy phase, you'll get it back, and then they'll engage with you, and then next turn you can repeat. This definitely invokes some fear. You're a non-elite specialist and the way you're doing it doesn't really work very well in enemy pile-ups. Hiding spot does feel a little bit tenuous, and I do keep thinking the more I play the deck, the more I probably want to include, you know, barricade or something like that in it. So the overall goal of this deck is because it has bad soak. Yes, you start off 7-7, seven, seven, but in the thicket for out of crossroads is something I viewed as necessary. For the same reason I went for short supply, scrounge for supplies, resourceful, as I needed hiding spots so badly because it's the one trap I think is really, truly exceptional in Pete, and if it's taking up my ability every turn, because it will be, I'm not getting any additional value out of traps on the other trap cards. So I wanted to make a deck that would find Hiding Spot as quickly as possible, capitalize on that every turn of the game, and then not run other traps. But I do think you can justify finding a slot for another trap in this deck, specifically one of those that manipulates enemy movement. However, because Hiding Spot's so important, I care about finding it so much that forced me to start with In the Thick of it. I'm coming in with 6-6 six, six Soak, and I didn't have an ally that I thought helped the deck. For me, since I knew I would need Old Keyring to really be a good cleaver later on, I thought Tetsuo Mori was a great use of my splash cards to help keep me alive. Howled Mirror is like the S tier of healing cards. I'm a little bit worried about dying. I like having it for helping my team, especially in a campaign that can hit as hard as Forgotten Age. You can see my three physical trauma is here because I died because my team like shuffled the deck and drew roughly five copies of Arrows in the Trees that hit the whole team repeatedly. So I ended up making a play where I used Hallow Mirror to keep my teammates alive and then my body to distract more enemies while we finished off Scenario 1. And you know, Scenario 1 Forgotten Age is hard as nails, so I'm not surprised it went badly playing a jank deck for the first time. But I do think Hallowed Mirror is an incredible card in Pete and in everyone else. And since I was worried about Soak, seemingly rightly so in this campaign, it's a great slot here. Take the initiative for Mythos Resilience is fantastic, because with 4 and 3, it's going to boost your chances from even to very good on most Mythos checks. So having already decided that I want to be using my ability on a hiding spot, making traps kind of shit, and used all five of my blue flex cards on a not fighting, that really does lock me into going the difficulty zero archetype as a cluver, because I'm not going to be good at fighting and my book sucks, so I need to reduce the book I have to be up against. Newspapers here for the same reason, it's not really difficulty zero, but it's a good clue finding card available to red, and a slot that won't be filled, because I'll be constantly recycling and getting new key ranks. And one in my hands at least. And after that, there's really not any room left in the deck. I've got a couple of generically good cards like Hey Card and Lucky, which I am planning on upgrading. Kicking the Hornet's Nest is the only card here that's really showing off that Parallel Pete has access to stuff other than Hiding Spot. And it's because getting an enemy out early is really valuable. It lets you start playing your guitar. It lets you dictate which enemy is spawning where sometimes in a way that's really important. You don't need much economy in this deck. You'll notice it's the only economy I'm running other than Take Heart. I do think Kicking the Hornet's Nest is an absolutely fucking fantastic card in Parallel Pete. In Trish, I think it's right on the edge of being viable. It's right on the edge of being in the top 30 cards in a competitively designed deck where you're trying to optimize. And in Pete, I think it's just unambiguously a good card that's worth running. This is the home that kicked the Hornet's Nest needed, that it couldn't quite find in Finn or Trish, but here it's genuinely an incredible card that deserves to be in the deck, and just unambiguously good. I think one of the big questions with Parallel Pete is, do I think he's better than Ashcan Pete? 
My original ranking of Ash Compete, this tier list is not entirely up to date for all the new stuff that's happened with the Taboo list and all the new stuff that's happening with Parallels coming out. However, with Ash Compete, I previously ranked him around the middle of A tier. I think he's a very good character, but most characters in Arkham Horror are pretty damn good to begin with. I'm not going to be comfortable saying I think Parallel Ash Compete is better than the vanilla one until I played him in like four more campaigns, so I'll probably never be comfortable saying that because only working against non-elite enemies makes him very strange. That deck I showed you is a cluver that also really effectively manages enemies. A lot of the times when you're looking at a two-player group, if you show up as the third player as a cluver, you're putting a lot of pressure on the fighter and Ashcan Pete's parallel really doesn't do that. He's able to be a sort of a flex character while playing a dedicated cluver role and fit into teams that other characters couldn't really do the same role in without causing problems. So that's a weird thing that makes it hard to evaluate within the context of team power levels. But additionally, because the, how common are non-elite enemies? If you're playing a campaign and there's just like constantly elite enemies spawning, that's gonna be a problem. If you're playing a campaign and there's an elite enemy in the Mythos deck, that's gonna be a problem. And if you're playing a campaign like Forgotten Age where elite enemies feel very rare, except for the Harbinger of Elusia, who, you know, that's the fighter's job, to dodge, not to fight, obviously. It feels like he's insane in Forgotten Age. Like, in Forgotten Age, I could probably very confidently move him up to A+, without really thinking about it. Because the thing is, if you're building a deck that does consistently find Hiding Spot, and does manage to find a decent number of clues, like not even a particularly good number of clues, you've essentially turned off a huge number of enemies, taken a huge amount of pressure, like more than your weight's worth, off of the fighter, so that they can just focus on the threatening stuff, the stuff with Doom, the stuff that gives victory points, the stuff that has the elite tag, and Ash can Pete, you just have all the three health cultists that don't do anything unless you attack them, bouncing around in the corners and hiding spots. He's really, really good at mitigating threats, even though he says non-elite. But because he says non-elite, it sketches me out. Parallel Ashcan Pete just feels so campaign dependent to me, right? There'll be campaigns like Scarlet Keys where he can't really fight, evade, or investigate very well. So his ability to do the mechanic and reveal the shadowed enemies just sucks, right? You can't use your guitar if they're in the shadows. That said, I don't rank them based on campaigns, and while I think there are certain campaigns he sucks in, I think in most campaigns, Ash Can Pete's Parallel is going to play really well. Because I thought Forgotten Age would be the stress test for this, because there are so many enemies, and the fear is that they pile up and you can't manage them, and that's just not happening. I think Parallel Ash Can Pete's probably really damn good. I think Parallel Ash Can Pete is already beneath people who are really damn good though, right? I'm incredibly hesitant to move him above like Yorick and Patrice or into my A+, but I think Parallel Ashcan Pete is probably better than Ashcan Pete on average. I think there'll be some campaigns where both of them suck and that's not unique to Parallel Ashcan Pete because the original Ashcan Pete doesn't seem great in Scarlet Keys either. And I think there are going to be a lot of campaigns like Forgotten Age where Parallel Pete just absolutely shines. I'm not entirely sold on it. Because like, make no mistake, this is a weird deck. This is like a strange team support deck where you're playing the guitar and dropping hiding spots and telling everyone they're safe because you can heal them because you built to stay alive yourself. And then you're using difficulty zero and really efficient cards available in Survivor to more than carry your weight on the clue front as well. It's a good deck, it's fucking jank, and I feel like I'm rambling about it. Because the idea of this deck, right, the idea that you're gonna use Pete's guitar to manage the non-elite enemies in conjunction with an F-tier card that has never seen play before, that literally doesn't do anything without another card to help it along. It feels ridiculous. And it is, right? Like, the snakes show up and you're like, it's all right. I'm gonna play a sick tune for him, he's gonna walk away and throw me a dollar on his way out. Like, the idea of what's happening is thematically insane, and it doesn't feel like it should be safe, because everything I do says not elite, and it just keeps working really well in the first half of this campaign. I think Parallel Pete's good. I think he is really good, although I think there's probably like two builds of him. One is this, and one is a jank fighter. And I'm fairly confident that the jank fighter is probably worse, because I mean, like, you could make a deck about recycling Ambush, but why would you do that compared to other things, right? I don't think it's unplayable, I just think that if you make a fighter parallel Pete, it's probably worse than most normal fighters, whereas you can get most of the same value out of playing the Cluer version and then still find clues. I think it's good. 
I think it's good and I hate that it's good because it's so weird and it stresses me out to be reliant on the non-elite tag and I'm going in circles because of it. But no, Parallel Pete's legitimately good and I'm legitimately hyped for it because it allows absolute garbage cards to see play and I think that's my favorite sort of character where they allow cards that never see play to become stars of the deck. Anyways, that'll be all for now. I've been Rather and Goherent. Thank you for listening to me ramble. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, Evan and Jeffrey B, and I'll see all of you in the next one.